You know, um, I want to tell you about a letter that I came across. You know that three years ago was uh, Charles Darwin's 200th birthday, and for the occasion, the Anglican Church of England wrote a letter, would you believe, of apology. Now, listen to what it says. It says, Charles Darwin, 200 years from your birth, the Church of England owes you an apology for me misunderstanding you, and by getting our first reaction wrong, encouraging others to misunderstand you still. We try to practice the old virtues of faith, thinking, understanding, and hope that makes some amends." End of quote. You know, we've come to the point where a church addresses itself to a dead man and asks for an apology. And not any man. It is a man who, do, who flatly contradicts the Word of God, but also whose theories still fuels racism and also hatred. What Darwin's theory is still doing is that it undermines human morality and provides an argument for superior and inferior races, working against the very foundation on which a church must stand, which is the scriptures. This theory is really the outcome of man's self-absorption, where he sees himself as the product of his self-doing and where God is completely pushed aside, just like what happened at Babel. It is the same lie, but this time it comes under the guise of science. But what is truly amazing in this is the preciseness of the Word of God prophesied that this type of things will happen in the end times. We read that at the end, Yeshua will be pushed out of the churches to the point where we see him outside the church, outside the last church in Revelation 3. What does he do? He knocks at the door. He's not in, he's outside. It is to the one, to this church, to whom he pronounced these very harsh words in Revelation 3.16. He says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Are we coming to this point? You know, these things show us that we are approaching the very end where the scriptures tell us that there will be a decrease of faith and a departure from sound doctrine. And it is to this church that Yeshua says in Revelation 3.14, he says, this thing says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation. The Amen, the faithful, the true witness, exactly what the church of the end will not be. Her witness and faithfulness would have been gone by then. And see how he ends this verse, the beginning of the creation of God, showing that he is the one who created the heavens and the earth and not chance. We are the creation of God and I love what Jesus says. Remember in Luke 21, he says, when you see these things, what do you do? Look up, for your redemption is, draws near. So let's now turn to the great book of Deuteronomy. Today we are going to look at more of these refreshing laws formulated by God, where man is giving his full dignity and respect. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22. And the deeper we get into these laws, the more we realize that Deuteronomy is not a legalistic rendering of the Mosaic law, but is an exposition of the spirit of the commandment. Some of the case laws we're about to see seem so exclusive and exceptional that they might at first appear so irrelevant to us. But a closer reading will show that they carry a great weight of applicable truth. Now, remember that these laws are presented in the same way as the law of Christ in the New Testament, that is, in a catristic way, that is, in case laws. In this way, man is called to assess carefully the situation, as if God calls us to be partners with him in looking at the very laws he's bringing. So let's go directly to chapter 22 and begin with the law concerning our neighbors. What kind of neighbors are we? Are we concerned or are we indifferent to our neighbors? Or are we of those who turn away our heads when someone is in need? Or are we of those who are unconcerned about the welfare of our fellow men and more importantly about the eternal destiny of the un our unbelieving neighbors? The law of God has much to say on this matter. Let's begin by reading verses 1 to 3, where we're taught how to be good neighbors and reflect the love of God to others. Again, some of the things we're about to read may seem unrelated to us. We're going to read about owing an ox or a donkey, things you will probably never own in your lifetime. But what is taught here is the principle 
behind each of these laws. Verse 1, it says, You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. And if your brother is not near you or if you do not know him, then you shall bring it to your own house and it shall remain with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with your donkey and you shall do the same with his garment, with any lost thing of your brothers which he has lost and you have found. You shall do likewise. You must not hide yourself. So here we are in the lost and found section in the Bible. The first issue concerns the restoration of lost properties. People are always misplacing or losing things, purses, money, eyeglasses, pen, pencils, etc. And the question is, what if you find something? Is it yours? What the law prescribes here is that if an item is ever found, it is to be returned to the rightful owner. That is, if you find something, you know that it's never yours. It belongs to someone who lost it. So it is our duty to seek that person and give it back to him. In fact, the law seems to say that if you find an item, this item is never yours. It should be considered at all times somebody else's item. And the law says that if you do not know whose it is, you ought to keep it for him until you find whose it is. Or to give it to the appropriate authorities. But this item is never used. This is the point of this law. Now, I don't know if you see the great principle in there. This is to truly have respect for others' property and to be satisfied with what you have. Following this law will help us not to transgress the Eighth and the Tenth Commandment. You shall not steal and you shall not covet. And be content with what the Lord has given you. This is at the root of a healthy society. It is at the root of a healthy spiritual and psychological state of an individual. It is the case of giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, whoever that Caesar is. However, there's a beautiful twist to this law. There's provision within this law where a person who found something can keep it. I want you to see how nice this is. Let's go to verse 19, Deuteronomy 24, verse 19. See what it says. It says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. This I find extraordinary. The scripture says, if you forget a shift, don't go back to get it. It not even belongs to somebody else. Now imagine the situation. Here the people who found the shift by law will have to bring it back to the owner of the field, whose it belong. And there the owner will say to them, it's yours because I forgot it. This is what the law says. That doesn't seem fair. But what is in a shift for this law to be formulated? You know, a sheaf is a big bundle of grain. It is too big a thing to forget unless you have so many of them. If you forget such a big bundle, it is probably because you have already many of them and you're quite full. So it does not mean so much to you. In fact, the Hebrew word for forget also means to ignore or to cease to care. So if you forget one, God says, leave it to the poor since you have so much. The law here is concerned with the right distribution of goods. It brings man to always be equitable and think about the welfare of his neighbor. This is a great facet, I want to tell you, of the Mosaic law. Whether it is the Mosaic law or the law of the Messiah, it is always caring for the individual, for the needy one. And this is what strongly comes out in the following verses. See verse 20 to 21. It says, when you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. These are great laws that show us that our, all our action, all our doing should, have, should always be done with a thought, a concern for the poor, for the needy. 
No man is an island. We all live with each other, and we all influence each other. And we can see this concern in another law concerning building codes. This also is not seen in any other laws of the time, such as the law of Hammurabi, which was formulated basically for an elite group of people. By the way, the Mosaic law was a revolution at this time. See what it says in Deuteronomy 22.8. See how we should be concerned with others. 22.8. It said, when you shall build a new house, then you shall make a fortification for your roof, that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. The Israelites went to enter the land and build houses for themselves. And in building houses, they had to think not only of the welfare, the safety of their family, but also of their visiting neighbors. The roof of a house at this time was flat and was used for many purposes. It was used for playground, for family and friend reunions. They were even building sukkahs or tabernacles there. I remember in Morocco, where the roofs also were flat, we would build big sukkahs, and there we'd invite family and friends and all eat under the sukkah. And before you do all this, any of these things, God says, make sure that your roof is safe. The word in the Hebrew used here is only used in here. Okay, it's not only to make a fence that is around the roof. So that no one falls. It speaks actually volume. The work is marke. Only used here, but the root is found in the word akab. You know what the word akab means? It means wickedness. As if to say protect your family and neighbors from wickedness. Fix your roof and cover it from all possible defect. Otherwise, it is wickedness. As the verse says, that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed in your household. What this law tells us is that we must be responsible citizens protecting the life of our families as well as those of our neighbors. And through all these laws, I want to tell you that the Israelites were being prepared to meet their Messiah. This was, I believe, one of the main purpose of the Mosaic law, both the ceremonial and the spiritual aspect of it. Their lives will be so regulated by love and by justice that when the Messiah would come, they would recognize the fulfillment of these things and bought it in one person. They would have so lived these laws that they will naturally be lured to him and readily identify him as the Messiah. They would have been trained to recognize him. Unfortunately, when Jesus came, it was a complete new religion. This is why they could not recognize him, but some did. Just like Nicodemus. Do you remember Nicodemus in John 3, 2? See the first words he said to Jesus. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. He is a teacher come from God. His teachings, his miracles, his ways were all the fulfillment of these laws. And this man of God recognized them. And how are these laws, how do they, these laws that is speak to us today? I believe they call on us not only to live by them, but to live them and to reflect Yeshua to others so that they will come to him. Remember when Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you shall love one another, John 13, 34. What was so new about this commandment since we see it right here in Deuteronomy? I want to tell you, what was new is that now the Messiah, who is love incarnate, was embodying and exampling these commandments as no one could ever done it before. It was new. And so like Nicodemus, we today have an advantage over the Israelites of the time of Moses. Now we can see these laws in full action in the life of our Messiah in the gospel. And there's something that today's believer has that Nicodemus doesn't have or didn't have which shows that we are in a much privileged position. Notice that years after the resurrection of Yeshua, John the Apostle speaks of yet another commandment. Remember 1 John 2, 8? We saw this on Wednesday night studies. He says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which things is true in him and in you. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. That is the third new commandment of basically the same thing. What was so new about this commandment? 
at this point in time, see what he says, which things is true in him and where? In you. The spirit of the Messiah who was given to you at the creation of the body of the Messiah lives now in you. And he helps us to exemplify these beautiful laws. And I want to tell you, the bar is very high for the one who professes that Yeshua is his Messiah. So we have the written commandment. Then we have the same commandment exemplified in the life of the Messiah. But now we have this commandment living in us, if, of course, we know him. So these laws we are looking at today should really be part of our new nature that the Lord has imparted in us. And so today, more than our ancestors, we have a great responsibility towards those that are around us. Much more is given to us. So we cannot possibly be lukewarm and indifferent to the others. It's against the law, the law of the Messiah. Let's now go back to Deuteronomy where we further learn that these laws were not only for our friendly neighbors, but also for those towards whom we might have developed some kind of hard feelings. I want to ask you a question. Suppose that someone stole money from you and he never wanted to give it back to you. In fact, he doesn't even return your calls. And one day, you find his wallet. And this wallet contains a good amount of money, maybe not quite what you are looking for, but a good, satisfactory chunk of money. Would you give it back to him? Or would you keep it, maybe thinking that God vindicated you? Okay, let's see what the law says. See Deuteronomy 22, 4. It says, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road or hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him lift them up again. Here are two important principles. Help your brother, whoever your brother is. And the second principle, God says, vengeance is mine. Right? Your faith should be in God, who is your great provider. And one should give back this wallet to whoever it belongs. And who is your brother, by the way? He is the one you love, and he is the other one that you must love. We tend to be nice to those whom we like, and we tend to be mean to those we grew to dislike. This is not proper to a believer. It is again against the law. We should not divide the body of the Messiah into those we like and those we do not like. Our love and help should be extended to everyone. If you're not sure that your brother is your neighbor, or if he's your friend or your enemy, this question is dealt with by the Messiah himself. He answered this question in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember in Luke 10? This parable is in answer to a question someone who supposedly knew the law well asked Jesus. And he asked him, he says, and who is my neighbor? To him, Jesus answered very, with a very simple parable of a man who was left dead by some thieves. But as guilty as these thieves were, we read of others who saw this man in dire need and did not do anything for him. Remember Luke, let's go to Luke 10, 31 to 32. I have it on the screen for you. See what it says. It says, now by chance a certain priest came down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at this place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Priests, Levites, those in our society, in this society, who should give the first example. But these were as guilty as the thieves in not helping the wounded man. But in who helps him, by the way? It's a Samaritan. The one who was considered the lowest in the Israeli society. A great animosity ex existed between the Samaritan and the Jews. A Samaritan will be the last person one will think of getting help from. Or helping. Yet in this parable, the enemy helps while the priests, the Levite, professional religious workers do not help at all. And at the end of the parable, Jesus asked the question in verse 36. It says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Verse 37, and he said, 
He who showed mercy to him, then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Our neighbors then is not only those that we love, it includes those that we must love. And so we must treat them all equally. In our passage today, there are some very interesting laws also concerning the order of things. You know, we live in a world where things can degenerate quite rapidly. And these laws in our Bible help us to follow a straight line, to put first things first. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22.5. It says, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord our God. See verse 9 to 11. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest this, the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as a wool and linen mixed together. There's an order in this life. And I believe that the intent of this law was to prepare the believer to understand also sanctification, to understand also that he is in a world that is not his, and that there's another world. He would prepare the believer to have a pure, distinctive life from the immoral and lawlessness behavior of the world. This law drove the truth of spiritual separation into the Israelites' mind and heart through everything they did. God wanted his people separated, sanctified, set apart. So when the Messiah came, they would say, hey, that's the one. That's the one I was trying to be like. They were actually trying to put on the Messiah, like Paul says. Let's look at these laws more closely. It says, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. How shall we understand this law? You know, today some may argue that this law is outdated since many types of clothing are shared both by men and women. But the idea behind this is that of respecting the social laws and standard we live under. This may change with time, but there will always be some standard we ought to live by and respect. And the believer is under these laws. It all amounts to respecting our neighbors. We have the same thing in the law of Christ. Remember in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, what Paul says. Does not even nature itself teach that a man who has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? You know that the main issue here is not the hair. Because in the Bible, people had long hair. It wasn't a bad thing, right? But the conformity, the issue is that the conformity of the social laws of the time, with respect of your neighbors and social values. There is nothing inherently wrong in having long hair. This is determined by the laws of the society, and we ought to live by them. And the greatest example is, of course, Yeshua. Remember in Luke 2.52, great words, says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. The word favor speaks of grace. He speaks of sweetness, of loveliness, and in respect. That is what these laws call for. Again, to be like the Messiah, Jesus conformed himself to the social values and respected everyone, of course, as long as it doesn't go against the word of God. And he was keeping a life of spiritual separation at the same time. That is a great example for us to follow. This, I believe, is the intent of these laws, sanctification, and at the same time, full respect of the place we live in. And the other laws, not me mixing seeds or different material in the garment or using two different animals to plow, bring the subject to respect the difference and distinctiveness in nature as well. And all this was to train the future evangelist not to mix truth, of course, and error, to avoid mixing the mixture of morality and immorality, of obedience and disobedience. And these laws end with a command, a command in this section of Deuteronomy, one that brings in the spiritual emphasis of these laws. Look at Deuteronomy 22.12, one about tassels. Look what it says. It says, You shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. 
Here is another law we might think do not concern us, but there's a great spiritual truth in this commandment. What are tassels, by the way? You have it in the screen. You know, tassels in Hebrew mean twisted threads. Okay, so they would, the religious Jews, the Jews at that time would wear this. Jesus wore, wore these things. And the reason is given in Numbers 15. Starting in verse 38, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it, and look what he says, to remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them, and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. And verse 40 says that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God is holy. You know, the object of the tassels was to remind the Israelites of the law of God, of the presence of God, and of the holiness of God while we are journeying in this life. They were physical reminder of God's law. It is significant that these tassels were also blue. Why blue? You know, to remind the Israelites that there is a blue sky up there. Sometimes we get so absorbed with things in this life that we need to be reminded of our eternal abode, right? Of our next life with the Messiah. Again, that was the fundamental uh, truth behind the people, believers in the Old Testament as we see it in Hebrews 11. Today we do not have to wear tassels, but we have a much higher reminder. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in us and always reminding us of the things we do right or we do wrong and leading us into higher and higher sanctification, day by day, hour by hour. It is this Spirit of God that teaches us about God and about the Father, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2.11. I'll read it for you. It says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God that dwells in you. So here Paul tells us that we cannot know the thoughts of man or the thoughts of God. The spirit is our link. He's our link to our neighbors. He's our link to God. And among the many laws given are also those that deal with money. Money that we owe, money that is stolen. They say that money is the root of all evil. Is this true? No. Good. There's nothing wrong with money, really. You know, but what we make of it. The Bible says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And this wrong love of money often brings people to lose their sense of justice. Their sense of what is right and what is wrong. The law speaks, by the way, much about it. See Deuteronomy 24, 15, just one of them. It speaks of one facet of this truth, and there's a lot in there. 24, 15. It says, Each day you shall give him, that is your worker, his wages, and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord, and it be sin to you. The law is very concerned with paying what we owe, especially wages to the workers. God listens to the cry and the complaints of those are abused and deprived of their belongings. And the principle of this law is not only for the employers, but is also for the employees because they can abuse the employers. This is what we see in Titus 2. 9 to 10, this one is for the employees who abuse their employer. He says, exhort workers to be obedient to their masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering. What does that mean, pilfering? You know, I tell you what the dictionary, dictionary says. It is to steal small item little by little and habitually. This is what it means. This is something the believer must not do. And the use of this word brings us further into considering the depth of this law. It is interesting that this word is mentioned only three times in the scriptures. You know where else it is mentioned? With Ananias and Sapphira. You know, and Peter, it says in verse 3 of Acts 5, he says, But Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Spirit of God by pilfering? 
right? By keeping back, same word, part of the price of the land. You know, when Deuteronomy 24, 15 says that each day you shall give him his wages, the principle covers all facets of our lives. Let's not take anything from anybody, especially from God. Give him what belongs to him, our ties to God. And what belongs to others, you give them. Theft is a serious problem. We see that the Spirit of God says through Paul in Ephesians 4.28, Let him who steal, stole, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And it is in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 16, by the way, where one finds a very, very strange law. One that seems to be out of place, but I want to tell you it flows with the rest. Here is the case of two brothers living together. One is single, the other one is married. The one who's married dies. And so the law states that the single brother should now marry the widow. And if he refuses, the whole, pro a whole procedure should be followed, among which the woman takes a sandal from his foot in front of everyone, and she spits on him. That's quite odd, but there's something Beautiful in there. Let's read a couple of verses and see what is happening. Just want to tell you there's so much than what meets the eye at first glance. Let's start with verse 7, verses to 10. It says, But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name for his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him, but he persists and says, I do not want to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, speak, spit on his face, and answers and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build his brother's house, and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. Now, First, what it says is that the man who refuses to marry his brother's widow, then the whole affair becomes a public one. Everybody knows about it. She goes, it says, to see the elders and the judges in the city, verse 7. And if these are involved, I want to tell you that the whole community is involved. So it's a big deal. And verse 8 indicates that these elders would try to convince the brother to take her as a wife because we read of the word, if he persists and says, I do not want to take her, that indicates to us that there was a, a strong conversation going on. And if he persists in refusing, while facing the judges and I'm sure the whole community that would gather around, she takes again her sandal and spits on his face. That's quite a story. How can we understand what is happening here? What is the, the purpose of this law? And why humiliate the man in such a manner? This is not all, by the way, because this man, if he refuses, he's stigmatized for life. This man will be remembered in verse 9 as the man who will not build up his brother's house. And as if it was not enough to add insult to injury, another name is given to him in verse 10. He will be called forever the house of him who had, had the sandal removed. Why so much on this matter? You know, on the surface we can say that the whole thing is designed so that the man does not refuse to take his brother's widow as a wife. The reason was not only so that the dead brother's name will be perpetuated, but I believe that this, this is another attempt to protect the woman here. This young widow, if not married by the brother, will be out of the house and this time will surely find it hard to find another husband, having been already married. But more than that, a wife did not inherit the husband's wealth. She will have to go out of the house empty-handed. And I believe that this law is given for the protection of the woman. This, I believe, is the whole intent of the law. It made it so difficult for the man that really had no choice but to marry her. You know, we already learned from the complaint of the daughters of Zelophehad. Do you remember? In Numbers 27. We learned that the inheritance of a man who dies goes to a male, never 
to the daughters. So if you remember, the, their father died, and since he didn't have any sons, they, gave, they were about to give all his money, all his goods, to a distant cousin. But the daughters had courage, and what they did, they went to, the, they went to God. They called on Moses, and they said, can you ask God if this is fair? You know, and I'm sure, you know, they, t- they took the risk to have fires, the fires of God to consume them, as we say it in, in the Torah. So in the text, Moses does not say a word. He goes in the tent of meeting and returns after a while, and I'm sure, to the surprise of all the leaders and the congregation whom we learn were at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And we read, verse 7, God says to Moses, the daughters of Zelophehad speaks what is right. You know what he did here? He actually went against the law of men. They were expecting God to say, no, don't give them the money. Don't give them the goods. But for the protection of the woman, God says, yeah, we got to change that law. I say they are right. You've got to give them what belongs to them. That was new, by the way. The women are right, says God. They are not inferior to you. Give them what belongs to them. The Mosaic law did not only bring man to his right and respectable place of one created in the image of God, but it puts a great emphasis on the protection of the woman, as Jesus did in his words. He emancipated the woman. Women were now, when he came, were not able to go to a Bible study. Not so with the Pharisees. So in Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 16, the man still had the choice not to marry the woman, but at what cost? It was better for him to marry. And following this law, Deuteronomy speaks much of the sanctity of the marriage. This is something that is very important. And some of these laws may appear very harsh. Just see what, one verse, Deuteronomy 22:21. It is the case where a man finds out that his fiance had an affair. After complaining to the leaders, they lapidate the woman. It says, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the man in her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house, so you shall put away the evil among you. You know the best commentary of this law is, where do you find this? in Mary and Joseph. Do you remember? When she was found with child, Joseph thought that she had committed fornication, as we see it here in Deuteronomy 22, 21. And before Gabriel, the angel came to him, we can see that a great man of God that this man was. In Matthew 1, 19, he says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, he didn't use the law, Right? was minded to put her away secretly. He really thought she committed a fornication. And while he thought that the circumstances indicated that something went wrong, being a fine man, he didn't want to harm Mary. You see, that teaches us also that the punishments of the law, we didn't have to apply them. Right? Here we see a man full of love. He would have had the right to make a public business of it all, but he abstained himself And right there, Gabriel came and appeared to him. Again, it shows that the punishments, above the punishments, there was something much higher, right? Love and grace. Love and grace. What the Messiah would be. Also, as for Mary, we can see that this woman was truly a woman of God. Just before, when the angel of Gabriel came to her to announce her that she was going to be pregnant by the Spirit of God, she completely relied on God, right? She knew that she could have been accused of fornication. Based on this verse, she knew she could have been lapidated, excommunicated, but she had so much faith in God. She says, whatever is right, I will do it. It is very right in you. However, there's also in this section what we learn about divorce. But here again, a very interesting and exceptional case is presented to us about divorce. We're going to close with this. Look at Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. See what it says. By the way, this is very complicated, but there's much truth in here. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and put in her hand and sent her out of his house. 
when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies or took her, who took her as his wife, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So we are here we are presented with an unusual case scenario. So strange that I believe there's some kind of irony here. First we read that the woman finds no favor in the eyes of the husband because he says he saw some kind of uncleanness. He doesn't say what it is because it seems that at this time they had their own range of definition as so to favor the man. It was not adultery because if it was adultery then it would be death penalty. So the idea here is that marriage must not be considered as a simple relationship based on the husband's feeling. Marriage is for life. It is not in the hands of the moods of a husband or a wife for that matter. It is a divine institution. Second, we read that the man must put her out of the house. But is not this both their house? This is what marriage is. 50-50. Third, as the confusion keeps its course, the woman marries another. Did not God say that in marrying they have become one flesh? And here the flesh is abnormally separated. Fourth, there's another bill of divorcement, another putting away. One is not enough. When in the world are you going to find such a situation like this? The ridiculousness of the situation shows how the marriage institution was reduced to. And so I believe that the scriptures give this example to Amplify the measure of confusions that surrounded this great institution. And the law was here to put it back in its place. In this example, again, the woman is seen as the mercy of the man and the society in general. Here the marriage stands on man's feeling, but the Spirit of God does not leave us with this sad example. I want you to read verse 5. Here he tells us what a healthy marriage should be. It says, when a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home for one year. That's very generous, by the way. And see what it says. And bring happiness in his wife, whom he has taken. So first, marriage is so important that God gives a full year of vacation to the one who marries. Next, in contrast to men's feeling in verse 1, where the marriage stood on his favor, here God tells us what he ought to do instead. He said he should bring happiness in the life of his wife. This is biblical marriage. This is what God instructed us. It is in verse 5 where God tells the man how he should behave towards his wife. Man should not seek his own happiness, but his wife's happiness. This is the law of Christ. This is why we are told four times in the New Testament that husbands should love their wives. Likewise, a woman should not seek her happiness, but the one of her husband. These make godly marriages and allow the spirit to work in the couple. It is sad to see how such a high institution is made so chaotic even today. This whole section could be summed up by what God said through Malachi. I hate divorce, he says. I hate divorce. Divorce, Malachi 2.16. And so to conclude today's study, there's a phrase that comes back many times in this exposition of the law. One that is repeated nine times from chapter 13 to 24. We see it in Deuteronomy 19.19. 19. See what it says? Then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. So you shall put away the evil from among you. This is the law. What the Word of God prescribes, sin has it, this property like this, to stick right to the person. Problems do not go away. They require our attention. So we should put away the evil in our lives. Let us bow in prayer. Almighty God and most merciful Father, looking at uh, your holy law, we may say that we have erred and stayed 
from your ways. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. Thank you for your word that steers our mind towards the proper way. Teach us even more your ways, O Lord, and show us your path. For your ways are good ways, and all your paths are wise. Lord, we do pray all this in the name of the one sitting at your right hand, our Savior, Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. May the Lord bless you. If you have any comments or... To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.